I want to talk about um, this communicative aspect also of all the technical elements. So uh, we as architects communicate through physical structures which also simultaneously have to meet a series of technical requirements clearly in terms of shouldn't collapse, should be durable, should be waterproofed and all of that, but that's not really our concern. That's just a constraint which we have to deal with and we need to work very closely with, our, with the engineers so that we can really orchestrate the ordering of the spaces through the phenomenology of the space, through the appearances, through the aesthetics in many ways, also because aesthetic is a form of messaging the character and type of interaction we're looking for. And I have to emphasize that as architects we are composing, and which is very different from um, just assembling a series of performing aspects in terms of technical performance, but composing means to make legible, to make understand, to communicate an institutional arrangement as much as having enough space and the elements physically present. And then we're also doing something which I call articulation to making, to emphasize certain elements and suppress others, to hide and accentuate and distinguish and characterize different features of the space and for that we use the technical elements. We use them not for technical purposes but for communication purposes. So I just want to indicate here that this has always been the case to some extent and um, with degrees of explicitness that technical systems become ornamental systems and ornament is not just making beautiful ornament is for me characterizing social situations, accentuating importance, accentuating movement and communicating to audiences how to behave and order themselves into a situation. So if look at all these uh, gothic examples um, there, we all know that there is a structural rationality which is present, but this is then heightened and distilled into a formal, aesthetic, and communicative system. And the, the, the variety of these equifunctional systems is also important. Um, there, are all, there are many ways in which to span a space even with stone and with certain constraints. So the selection in the end can't be determined by an engineering optimization because there's always equifunctional in many ways of technically succeeding. So we have to select on the basis of another agenda. And this agenda, in my view, is the architect's agenda of making visible and communicative distinctions to give particular character and identity to particular spaces and places. And I think that modernism made a mistake. There was a fallacy there that one could strip bare the built environment and consider ornament as a superficial or superfluous add-on which is just costing and not delivering anything. And I think that was fallacious because architecture must speak so that we can navigate a complex social order. And that was the slogan of postmodernism, then reintroducing an, an articulation agenda. But what I believe find fascinating in the tradition of architecture is that this articulation agenda is not done with graphics and colors on plasterboard, but with the actual substance of the physical constitution of the building rather than kind of doubling up. There is a reutilization of what's already there, what's coming out of the technical performance 
is then selected, orchestrated, and heightened into a social communicative performance. And just showing, for instance, the way we work with this, we were fascinated that co the contemporary um, architectural condition with all the new tools we have, the, new, the, the handling complex geometries that we can regain the intricacy and sophistication of something like a Gothic where one type of structure over hundreds of years was refined and honed in and, and developed the culture and a certain variability, but the variability was very small. This, there's always the same bay repeated on and on and on. To do something like this, but with more variability and also to give the exterior uh, condition the same level of intricacy than the interior condition in this case. And to have that, let's say, parametric variability of an inside out Gothic, for instance, as and with more variability, with having both shell and, and uh, compressive structures like the Gothic, then combined with tensile structures, and you get a new hybridization. But we have a similar richness of articulation, which we're interested in, to create multiple characters and types of spaces and a unique identity for a particular uh, piece of architecture. And this is student work, by the way. And when we are at the Design Research Lab and the AA, we are exploring material systems for their formal capacities, then we, we, we become um, exploring formal universes for the sake, I believe, intuitively, of enriching our repertoire of articulation and communication, but we do that with physical systems which have their own constraints and characters rather than inventing in a void we want to make the physical constitution transformed into a medium of communication. And again, what needs to be emphasized here is that, that all these systems I'm showing here have some kind of material, computed rationality, material, physical um, congeniality between form and, and physical performance, but we're also hunting, of course, for for that repertoire of articulation um, to make varied and diverse and versatile the, uh, the language through which we want to um, express and communicate all the different situations, social situations, which we encounter now in the city. It's not only like during the Middle Ages there was one special space and that was to be distinguished from the city, which is, was the cathedral, the, sp the space of contemplation. Now we have hundreds and hundreds of different situations which need to be distinguished with degrees of importance, but with their own character and recognizability. So we are no longer in that world of a modernist homogeneity where there's only f a very, very few different kind of things which occur in society when everybody is more or less uh, in the same situation. <laughs> Uh, like the mid 20th century, we're now in a situation of very, very diversified lifestyles and uh, divisions of labor. And so we need that enlarged repertoire of articulation. And we go, we do our models, we have physics, we use mathematics, we go into nature as analogs, just in the search of these characterful logics, which at the same time have that rash the rationality of a nature-formed logic. I sometimes propose this, show this project to show you how um, the architect's approach to a utilitarian structure is very different from a pure engineering approach. And what makes a difference is what I call the compositional stance or the you could call it the compositional agenda. Because what we're looking at here is a park and ride scheme. It's very pragmatic. And in the end, my claim is that this inverted comma artistic way of working with such a utilitarian structure is, makes it even more useful and utilitarian and pragmatic than a pure engineering project would have been. So what we're looking at here is a park and ride scheme with a 
car park, which actually segmented into two car parks cut off by a street. There is a tram station and a bus station. So if you, le if you imagine a bus station, a tram station, and two car parks in this kind of landscape, it could totally get lost and disappear in this kind of disarticulate no man's land. And you wouldn't find those aspects and they wouldn't, in that sense, function well for people who have to quickly move between these systems. So what, what we did instead, we have all the right parking bays and spaces, we have the demarcations, we have the lamp posts, we have the roof for the tram station, the roof for the bus station, but all these elements are brought under a ruthless, inverted commas, artistic formalism because there's different ways to create a car park, different ways to create a roof, different ways to create a... Uh, and we always choose those in connection with each other so that they all add up to one very easily legible, signaling, strongly communicating um, an expressive communication. So we bring, we make formally similar the lamp posts to the car demarcations we put everything on the curve so that they draw together like a swarm. We increasing the lamp post side as we come closer to the to the roof, and then we are fo assimilating the lamp posts to columns, and the demarcations flow in as cuts and lights into the roof. So we're making different pragmatic things similar to each other formally, so that they participate in an overall formal gesture. There is not the slightest compromise on their pragmatic functioning because these lamp, these columns function perfectly, the lamp posts function perfectly, the demarcations function perfectly, and the curvature of the overall doesn't disturb the parking arrangements, but they make a very, very strong gestural and easy navigable communicating system. And that we, for instance, bring those concrete area in is just drawing together the car park into the park and rides roof. So what I'm emphasizing here is that when we come in as architects, we're not in charge that these lamps really function as lamps. That's engineering business, that these columns are strong enough, that's engineering business. That's con what, what are we in charge if all the technical functionality is given to engineers? You can also have a traffic engineer laying out the, the base and the, and the ra turning radius. So we have basically, in theory, if you want to think engineering logics, we have nothing left to do and we're in charge of nothing. Uh, and then it says, oh, isn't that horrible, we're only decorating. I say, no, that's wonderful because decoration is the most important thing because that transforms some kind of nowhere structure into an easily, intuitively navigable, elegantly functioning uh, human interaction space which communicates its purpose and through that functions much better. So that's the kind of hyper-pragmatism through communication, and that's what I call the core competency of architecture, and that's uh, the way I see the relationship between architecture and engineering. And that also functions at night quite beautifully. Uh, so I have been talking about parametrism for quite a while, and I have recently published and put together this magazine called for AD, collecting a whole series of protagonists who have been working and maturing over the last 20 years, under the slogan of Parametrism 2.0. And what I mean by this is I, I'm saying that Parametrism now should move its focus from technical functionality and investing in engineering logics and parametric variability for complex structures and skins and environmental uh, parameters into focusing on social parametrism, on, on that aspect of communication and social ordering. Um, and I've published two articles in there plus the, orient plus the introduction to do that. But within that, I've collected all my protagonists who have been invested in pushing prima facie anyway, explicitly what they talk about is logic of structure, logic of fabrication, logic of environmental adaptation. So they are engaged, it seems, in a system of proto-engineering. And sorry, I just wanted to point out here in these two images that uh, these are my articles. And I just go through some of the structures I've been 
showing in the article this is the work of Achim Menges. So he has done a series of uh, pavilions experimenting with different materials, with different structural logics, morphological uh, systems, environmentally adaptive systems, uh, things like active bending, things like hexagonal shells, um, things like the robotic weaving of carbon fiber, also in shell forms, or modularized um, woven carbon fiber elements. And what I find fascinating about all of these, and this is robotically pasting, uh, uh, mapping carbon fiber onto an inflatable, what I, what I think important about these, we should watch out how different in character they are, they are how identifiable they are, how um, even though they're all pavilions in a similar form, they have a very, very different tectonic character, which comes out of the fabrication and structural and material logics. And my push on this is why are, are we doing this? Why are we so fascinating, fascinating about it? This, it's not that we would now select the best and most efficient way and then do everything in this way. What is fascinating about here is precisely that they are so distinct in their character and that I could use that to distinguish different zones, different rooms, different aspects of the city or of an institution in this way. So I think my interpretation of Achim's work, although he is, he's only talking about these engineering and fabrication rationalities, is that we're actually hunting for uh, a diversified language, identities, characters, which we could use for what I call then the semiological project. And what I find fascinating, when parametrism started and we discovered nerve surfaces, everything was these blobs and nerve surfaces. And that becomes quite quickly, it has a lot of variability, the, the, you can do lots of composition with those, but this is the next profound step. Instead of everything being those nerve surfaces, we now have this kind of series of tectonic systems which allow us to be much more versatile and communicative, a much more rich vocabulary, and that's what I want to emphasize with these projects. Similarly with, the, with my ex-student and former collaborator Mark Fawns, who has very, very different types of pavilions, and there's, again, fabrication logic, there's intelligence there, and it's very important because with these robotic logics or laser cut and embedding a, a complex form in a pattern, you get economic efficiency. You know that you can be realized super fast, super light. All these technical criteria I endorse, and I find them wonderful, but that's, in the end, will be engineering business. So here the architects are doing kind of the engineering engineers work as non-engineers and they do it to the best of abilities but as soon as it scales up a little bit they have to hand that over. So that's a proto-engineering but for me this is also proto-semiology, proto-communication enhancement and that's what I'm talking about and in a sense interpret their work as and that's what I'm interested in. So you can see there's a kind of strong ornamental uh, drive in these projects because they are so distinct again, so so interesting and and curious, and of course they're also incredibly efficient. They're super super thin and super light, and the curvature makes stiff. And all these stories, of course, they are relevant, but they're engineering aspects, and we should interface or know about them, push engineers to this to bring that into our repertoire. But what I'm interested in emphasizing is that articulatory capacity. And you can see there's also a drive for graphics, for ornament, unex unexplained by Mark himself. And I'm trying, this is what we need to do. And this also uh, applies to uh, industrial design, by the way, fr my friend Ross Rafkov, who I've included, um, and into, into fashion design. And I'm also trying to do this. So when I look at fashion, I have a similar attitude. I'm going to the sports industry, I'm going to super light, neoprene, perforations, I'm talking about moisture management, movement management, uh, certain cuts, stiffness, elasticities. So these are all technical engineering style parameters, but in the end it's also to generate that character, that otherness, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that elegance, and the variability of different types of fabric which are now possible rather than just this one woolen fabric or the applied uh, ne uh, stripes is again an enrichment of um, articulatory possibilities. And we look also in the magazine, we look at the protagonists and, he and precursors of this, let's say, engineering div driven repertoire expansion, the Esther 
Fry Otto. And what fascinates is the difference between this and this. This, on the one hand, we know that is a new world, a new, new kind of nature-like exploration, but the difference between these kind of tensile structures on the one hand and these um, inflatable structures and shell structures rather, or, sorry, they're not inflatables, that's the distinction in, in, in character which I find very significant and very, very important and something we, we want to run with. And again, it was never articulated, it was never on the agenda for FI Otto, but I think we should make it an agenda and I've been making it an agenda. And looking also back at Gaudi's work, and again, look at the expressiveness of this. And of course there is geometric and structural rationalities are drivers, but a very, very strong intuitive drive towards ornament, but ornament isn't excess. Ornament is hyper-instrumental. I don't think they could live in a world without ornament. And that's some, one of my arguments. And we come, we do that as well as our own kind of research group. We're working with shells and tensile structures and we uh, develop new techniques of making, refining and giving character and efficiency. I mean that, that we drive efficiency doesn't mean that we can't look for aesthetic stimulation and otherness and, and, and articulatory intricacy and make that uh, the medium of communication. And you can see these very, very, very strong, expressive um, structures, maybe stronger than the original uh, Candela shell, which was just the, where, where the reinforcement was, 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 was hidden, in a sense. And here we have a much more direct articulation of stress lines, but they're also incredibly intense uh, flow lines, and you can flow the forces, you can see where the entrance is, where the, where the columns would be, and then you can hook onto this as an orienting a mechanism rather than a kind of neutral white surface, this is much more potent for structuring flows and interactions, I would argue. And we do that at code. We have various subsystems. Again, we're no longer working with NURB surface simply. We, there may be a backdrop upon which to do, for instance, curved folding, like an origami style robotic folding, or we use things like um, hot wire cutting, which delivers only ruled surfaces. And these all get, are kind of character dri drivers and give a, uh, we, there's always a multiple, the, the superposition of multiple objectives and we need to know which objectives are we in charge and which objectives are the engineering's objective and we need to kind of find that synergetic serendipitous uh, coincidence but we can because we have so many options that we can then select those where various advantages overlap and that would be our task as architect orchestrators. And the good thing is we are in the finally in, in charge and, and um, we, the engineers deliver the constraints. Why are we in charge? We, we are close to the client and what the client wants from us is that life process articulated and, and arranged. And then all the technical questions come are subsidiary to this. But I think we can make them drivers to the extent that they are still remain orchestrated under an overarching what I call ordering agenda, the architect's ordering agenda. And this is where we do also, for instance, we do shell structures and we say reticulated shells so you can perforate them. And once you have, that's the engineering analysis and now there comes, and I could have started with various similarly optimal and good uh, spanning forms. We are homed in on this, then there's a certain stress line pattern, but then I have again options. How am I translating those stress lines? And I can extrude them, I can make them finer or broader, I can make them more distinct from the background or blend them in the background or I can articulate them as pleats. Now, no engineer can, uh, can tell us which of these translations we should do, nor will an engineer ever tell us you have to do this kind of uh, parabolate shell. That's not the way it works. So there's always um, a multiplicity of equifinal, equioptimal, let's say, uh, uh, systems, and we orchestrate and select based on what? Based on this idea of a, in the end, semiological structuring of social processes. And or you can translate this into where you, how you, and where you perforate and bring light into a structure. 
And you can see here that these things take on that ornamental richness quite quickly of uh, a traditional architecture. And this is some of the project, uh, one of the recent projects we've been working on. In, and again, this is, uh, in, inhabits that strange space of technical optimization become hyper aestheticized articulation, let's say, and hyper charged potentially with messages of, of festivity, of importance, of primary versus secondary versus tertiary uh, uh, spaces, etc. And of course, you can also go then on top and go in with a color, color codings which, and material codings uh, which are seem, yeah, you have more freedom and maybe less technical constraints, but even if you give color to a paint, that will reflect more or less light at lux levels you, you have to deal with. So even there, there is, there's, there is always technical constraints and technical questions to fold in and turn into messaging. And I find what I call this kind of tectonic articulation more credible and more intuitively graspable than where you would hide all the tectonics with plaster water and then come with an arbitrary color coding. That has less, in a sense, I would say, impactful and, and, and credible. You can kind of lie much more with this. I want to say here again, we have many different ways of developing the reticulation. Um, there is no best way. Um, that would be a fall fallacious hypothesis. And uh, in, in, even if the one is slightly, slightly better than the other, we're still insisting of making those spaces not all the same, because then you would again get lost and you never know where you are. So there's a point in simply making differences and making a network of contrasts and similitudes. It's not only this is different, this is relatively close to this, but more different from that and then and, and other aspects affiliates again. So that's the way we navigate. We need to know what belongs together, one thing leading to another. In a complex institution, we need to really know what, 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 what in the end, these, all these differences of pattern mean something in terms of what belongs together, what is distinct from each other, uh, what leads to what. And um, We do that not, not only with, 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 with hard surfaces, shells, there's this whole discourse on tensile structures we've been using. And again, here, what is nice, the forms are, you, there's a constraint. You don't randomly invent forms, like even with the, if you play around with nerve surfaces, of course, nerve surfaces are mathematically rigorous, but there's maybe too many degrees of freedoms, and that means you get quite quickly, you lose the, char the characterfulness which comes through the constraints. So that's why we like with, with these kind of Fry Otto style form finding constraints. So they give a rigor and recognizability to these systems. And then you can kind of switch system. And then you, all the different spaces you do with tensile, they will all connect up because they always have that recognizability through anticlastic surfaces. And then we also combine shell and tensile structures. So when I've done a series of uh, studios, this is at Harvard, doing a Google campus, and we try the system, and you quite quickly see maybe this is, becomes too homogenous. You artificially try to do different grains, degrees, colors, but maybe there is not enough repertoire in this. Maybe it's too much single system. And uh, the way we're doing this project from the office I showed you earlier, there, we, are, we are closer to what something could work. You can get kind of lost in this quite quickly. And uh, so we need more variability and have different types of projects and they all are quite distinct, but maybe the different districts within such a campus should be more characterful. So a single student, a single system is most probably not delivering. So we need to um, have something more differentiated. I mean, these different projects are all in my crit self critique too homogenous even though there is a lot of vari variability in each of them, much more than in the modernist. And uh, just showing th th this project, it's still more of a kind of a NURB surface project, but we're also working with different surfaces. The landscape rolls in. What is important about this is it's a very open and free form. It, it pours into different corners, 
picks up different levels, mediates and calms down in a very, very chaotic zone, but has these continuities from building to landscape and the different surfaces. But it's important that, for instance, a main entrance is a cut. A lot of openings and windows are suppressed. Uh, they're actually pouring through a perforation so that you actually focus the view on key moves, key entrances, which are articulated as funnels or as cuts, and everything else is suppressed. So it's accentuation and suppression to make such a structure navigable and legible. And you have, of course, multiple views and multiple trajectories. It's very complex. And if you wouldn't, in a sense, reduce complexity uh, through uh, having a coherent logic and suppressing a lot of detail, you would get a kind of undigestible clutter. But I will talk about later the, the, the way the cladding, the perforations, and the subdivision logics accentuate the space and the lines of division, we are not just mapped the grid on, are kind of accentuating the flow and, and guide you through the funnels, as it were. So there's a lot of um, uh, coherence between overall form and tessellation, which I think makes enhances the plasticity and legibility of the building beyond what it would have if it was just purely seamless. So here, there's again, you need technically to break and tessellate and once you have that necessity, it becomes an artistic question how you do that in a way which is most congenial to the flow of the form, to the navigation requirements of, of your audience. And that's the way we treated windows and light. And actually, from the inside, you can see quite through these. It's, it's very surprising. And a little bit of technical that these are reprogrammable molds to, to make all these panels unique. But of course, there is a whole technical project which we are involved in, which is the, the space frame underneath and the, all the M&E and the technicalities. What I'm saying, in the end, that's just constraining. We have to know to the extent that we want to shape and mold that body. But what we care about, and that's in the end the division of labor, we care about the volume and the final visual surface and all things under the hood are in a way we don't care about. We only care about it if it messes up or pushes through or thickens too much. We then need to know to push them back and uh, not let them coming through. But that's the division of labor. We are only the surface guys, and only what hits the retina and, and, and plays with light and gives us a sense of, of, of appreciation and, and orientation. And all the guts are not our business. And I'm saying this is. Um, not superficial, surfaces are what we live and, and structured by as audiences. So all that construction process stuff and making it happen in a way should be outsourced to te technicians. We just need to, need to make sure that the final surfaces are what we wanted them to be or we keep reacting to the requirements of what's coming from under the hood and then each, if there are, for instance, vents coming through or all sorts of technical necessities, we turn them into a palette of artistic translation. And that will be our task. Like we turned the, all the lampposts and car park demarcations and columns and lights into a, into a palette of, of kind of painterly artistic uh, communication. There's also things like uh, affiliation to, 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 to existing patterns, etc. These are the kind of things. They're, they're not directly performative in a technical sense. They're performative in a, in, an, in a visual sense. And in the end, I mean, this is all there only for one purpose to structure these events, to, to host these urban spectacles and exhibitions and events and fashion shows. Uh, they become a stage. We are constructing stages for social interaction. And only architects really care about the particulars of that window and column and, and become fetishistic about it. But whereas for, for audiences, it becomes a kind of background which has a certain character, and it matters to them what it feels like, what the atmosphere is, and what they learn from it, 
rather than what it, what it is in its kind of detailed constitution. And again, these projects have perforation, tessellations, um, different materialities, thresholds, which are articulated seams, which become where one thing switches to another. That is always something where uh, maybe an entrance is articulated, a change of scenario or uh, situation is indicated. And again, I show you that we, we, we do this in ways which emphasize variation and different zones. So the contemporary big hall shouldn't be this one homogeneous neutral thing, but it should be something which has various parts and subparts which bleed into each other because that's the way modern life is like. It's very intricate with different simultaneous situations. That's much more a public space than one big hall with a center. And again, we're looking at things like color, reflectiveness, uh, tile sizes, in, to emphasize maybe corners, to show uh, the constitution of a body, and to heighten the plasticity. And again, what is important here, that the different pragmatic elements like steps and lights, they are brought under that formalism. This staircase is perfectly viable as a staircase, right? So, but if I would take that space and make it a rectangle and then plug a staircase in which is selected on pure engineering purposes, then I buy some lights and plug them on purely on lux level requirements. Then I come in with a handrail. Then I come in with uh, all sorts of other things. I'm ending up with a disarticulate clutter and I, no lo and I miss a sense of how the space flows, where the space guides me, because the space becomes complex enough. There's inside to outside, back to inside. There's a flow, so in order to make that grasping of a complex spatial arrangement possible, you need to actually bring all the, nest, the, the, the pragmatic elements under some kind of formalism which helps you to grasp, grasp the space. So the light element isn't only there anymore to bring some lux levels into the space and the stair isn't only there to physically move step by step, but the two collaborate together to describe a spatial flow which tells you where you are. And that's the architect's task. That's the compositional stance. That's what we are experts in. And that's what we should start talking about and not talking about the lux levels, because that's, in a sense, a constraint which we learn from. And then we get the number of lights necessary. But then we do a compositional effort. And that compositional effort is hyper-functional, because if we would and use the engineering logic to create a space like this, it will look like a kind of junk backyard, um, let's say a kind of delivery yard. If you go to buildings, they all have this. All buildings have these kind of delivery yards and, and machine rooms, and that's what you get if engineers pick each element without compositional gender for its most robust, cheapest, effective, and not orchestrating at all. But you can imagine that these kind of junkyards uh, and backyards are absolutely indigestible and socially dysfunctional, right? Because they only work for the three people who are always there every day and can find their, the different uh, pieces there, but they're not, they can't be regarded as meaningful social spaces. And it's very important to grasp that difference and the importance of that formal compositional agenda, which becomes a communicative agenda, particular and circumstances of complexity, where we want to have many different spaces coming together, overlook each other, like in this space. I mean, this space, compared to what we're doing here, is overly cluttered. And it's actually to see a person. Here, you, a person moving is so clearly against that background. Here, you, it's kind of 
all too confused. There is, here is not enough compositional articulatory force in the space. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's gone kind of off balance. Let's say this idea of maintaining control in terms of the articulation is something which we need to be very, very um, uh, insistent upon, particularly with all these so many more requirements coming in. Now we're having the, you know, the, all the fire requirements, the sprinkler requirements, the, the, the insulation requirements, it keeps piling in. It was relatively easy for a Niemeyer who only had to deliver a concrete surface and it becomes ever more complex to us. All the more we have to be ruthlessly formalist when we, when we try to do this. And you see the complexity of these spaces where you view across levels, where you're from the inside to the outside and back to the inside. And these kind of spaces, and again, maybe characterizing differently with a warm material, a different space, a new semiology, but then using similar language. You know you're in the same building, but in a totally different space. And again, we're using these kind of stripes and cuts to deliver light, to deliver staircases, to deliver balustrades, to deliver these things, rather than having lots of different things cluttering together and therefore obfuscating the situation. And I just want to show these that the complexity keeps increasing. The kind of simultaneity of spaces and moves and offerings and possibilities coming together ever more condensed and all the more is it important that we maintain that compositional control over things because otherwise we're literally in a visual chaos and functionality stops. But these projects are highly uh, structured with these ruthless formalisms which of course at the same time are, are based on certain performance logics. But you can see the, the amount of things going on here and yet it feels easy, feels, feels natural. You move in and out through levels you move from the outside to the inside and you recognize there's continuities and, and context and similitude and you can be suspended with things above, below and all around and still feel that there is a, there's an order. There's a complex variegated order you can navigate on. The inside is continuous. Oh, okay. And again, this is kind of a recent, audit, uh, a recent atrium and there is a kind of super graphic formalist agenda but these things are benches, reception desks, again this could be a kind of clutter of stuff but it is not. These are doors and lift doors and you pull through the lift doors and so every, the, stair, the steps play together with these benches, everything is brought under this uh, graphic artistic formalism and that's I think very potent because you can grasp, do not disturb, these things don't kind of compete for attention and they generate a kind of background. And the complexity of these is amazing. And I just want to show that we're going further. We want to bring that space of simultaneity to a new kind of level of coexistence. So mega atria where literally thousands and thousands of people and spaces and things congregate into a complex space rather than saying we are and that's the way we want to be we want to know what's going on we want to network we want to participate in what's going on we no longer want to hide go into a little lobby go into an elevator box down s cut away from each other on each floors corridors and cells thousands of people hiding away from each other in a cell nobody knows what's going on that's something else that's very simple there you cannot get lost you know you're on the fifth floor and you're in corridor three and you always go to the same spot. But we're in a different condition. We're browsing a complex network of thousands of people which we need to simultaneously aware of. And that's my new vision of, for instance, corporate headquarter buildings. It's, it's not differentiated enough. It's too generic. But this is the kind of spaces I would like to uh, offer. And we're working on some of those.